Hey, Journey Church, good morning. I hope you're having a great week this uh, locked in time. Hey, let's pray and then let's uh, dig into God's word together, okay? Lord, thank you for today. I thank you for the lessons you're teaching us. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, speak to our hearts today. Help us to listen to you uh, and then to be able to apply what we hear today to our lives so that we can live, live lives that are um, honoring to you and bring glory to you, um, e even though circumstances change all the time. So, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word that sets us free. Um, guide us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for the next several weeks, we are going to jump into the Gospel of John, uh, going on a journey with John, one of Jesus' first followers. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that John, that's who we're going to follow along with. Um, John wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote three shorter letters in the back of the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Not real creative with the names, but uh, they, we know who the author is anyway. Um, John was with Jesus from the very beginning of his ministry, and he saw and he heard a lot of things, and so I think we can learn from him. That's our hope today. And one of the, one of the most important things that, that um, John addresses over and over again is the importance of believing. Uh, perhaps two of the most misunderstood words in all of religion are the words faith and believe. Now, now for just a minute, if you would set aside all, all the religious thought and uh, all the theology, and, you know, really, then we know what these two words mean. But somehow in religion, we get these two words uh, all mixed up, and they take on new meanings, and, and, and even taken on, taken on different meanings than, than they uh, were intended to. In, in the real world, world, we believe based on evidence. Uh, what we believe is based on what we see and what we read. It's also based on our confidence in the person who is delivering the information to us. When you were in grade school, for instance, you were taught that 7 times 7 equals 49. But, but none of us went home after we learned that lesson and lined up seven rows of seven things and then counted them to make sure that it was 49. So we believed based on evidence, what we saw and what we experienced. And then we believe also based upon uh, what we are taught by someone that we have confidence in. Now every once in a while there's conflicting evidence and uh, we get two pieces of information and we compare them and we're not really sure what to believe. For instance, um, is coffee still good for us, all of you coffee drinkers. If you're not into coffee like me, uh, then let me ask it this way, is, is chocolate still good for us? Yes or no? Go, go ahead and tell the person next to you. Yeah, okay, good. There's been a lot of research done about both coffee and chocolate, and depending upon who you listen to, they can both be good for you or both be bad for you. And if you only listen to information that confirms what you already believe, well, that's called confirmation bias. We all do this. And here's the point. Faith and belief do not change definition when it comes to Christianity. Unfortunately, religious faith and belief are, are often separated from reason, and they're confused with hope. We, we can hope that something will happen, even when we believe it won't, like take, for instance, the lottery. We can hope that we win it, but we believe that we won't. There's not much of a chance. Now, now hope is good, but it's just not the same as believing. Terry Bradshaw this week said that he believes in his heart that NFL football will be back this fall. Well, that's, that's hope talking, not believing. Now, now, some of us grow up hearing things like this. Well... You just got to believe. And if you grew up in church, it sounds like this. Well, you just got to believe, brother. You just got to take it by faith, sister. Well, we've got to have, you, you just got to have more faith. That's what it takes. Which really doesn't make sense because we really either believe something or we don't. Is it, is it faith it or fake it? Is it faith it and Tell you can fake it, or the other way around? Isn't that the same thing? Well, that's not what Jesus taught at all. Well, one author wrote this. He said, 
The reason that so many people are easily talked out of Christianity is because they were never talked into it in the first place. The reason so many college students are talked out of Christianity is that they were just simply told growing up, you just got to believe, brother, you just got to believe. And they did as a young child. And maybe, and maybe that's what you were told. You just got to believe. And maybe, maybe you did because you were young enough and you believed what your Sunday school teacher said or the preacher or your parents or an older sibling, and you just believed. And then someone talked you out of it after you grew up. And they had some reasoning behind and the, your, your belief didn't seem to hold water. Or maybe you read a book or heard a lecture or you saw a debate and, and it just kind of confused things. And so you stopped believing. Maybe faith is faking it after all. Well, John's going to lead us on this journey of faith, a journey that he wrote all about in his Gospel of John, and he asks us to follow him. So let's do that. John was not content with just telling us what happened. John tells us why it happened and, and why he wants us to know that it happened. At the end of his writing, he gives us his thesis statement, his uh, the reason that he wrote his Gospel of John. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke had already been written, according to historians, but about Jesus' life. But, but there, you know, we asked the question, well, why do we need a fourth Gospel? And, and John took this opportunity to share with them some things specifically. In fact, here's what he said. This is the reason that I wrote this Gospel of John. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, John wrote which are not recorded in this book. I didn't write everything, but there's a lot of things. But these things were written, he says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John says, Jesus did a lot more than what I wrote down, but I, I picked out some specific signs, from some specific uh, stories that I wanted you to know. And the reason is so that you might believe that Jesus is, is the Son of God, and that by believing, you could have life in his name. I didn't write it so you would just know what he did. I want you, I want you to have a reason to believe. I don't want to just tell you, you got to believe, brother. You, you got to have more faith, sister. So he said, I want you to be convinced that Jesus is who he says he is. So I'm going to show you. Uh, I was there. I saw it, and you can believe what I saw and what I'm writing about. So we're going to take, uh, take a look at John's story and John's uh, journey with Jesus so that we can believe. And then he would question, um, th then, then he would say, uh, believe, why, 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 would we, why would we ever doubt once we hear what he has to say? So John, as he writes, doesn't just give us random events and random conversations. It looks like that as we read through it on our own. But he organizes his entire Gospel of John into uh, around seven different signs. It's, it's interesting that John uses the term signs instead of miracles when he teaches what Jesus did. He, um, and the, the supernatural acts of Jesus, the, the miracles, the healings, the walking on water, all of those things were not random acts of kindness, nor were they opportunities for Jesus to just show off. There was a purpose behind every miracle that Jesus performed. And then John, he refers to these signs. He says, these signs that point towards who Jesus really is. Now, now it's easy to get excited about miracles for all of us, especially when you need one, right? Well, but, but John shows us that these miracles, again, have a specific purpose. And that purpose is to point people to the identity of Jesus Christ. Now, these miracles or signs are to point us to Jesus. Okay, so are you ready for sign number one? You probably already know this one uh, if you've been in church very long. In fact, why don't you go ahead and tell the person next to you what the first sign was, the first miracle was. Go ahead and tell them. Make sure they get it right. Okay, ready? You know it. Okay, it's turning the water to wine. Okay, that was his first miracle. John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. John says, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee, which is about 60 miles north of Jerusalem. Jesus' mom was there. 
His mother was there. Interesting. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to this wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother turned to him and said, they have no more wine. Well, now wedding celebrations in those days went on for days and days. They, they were huge events. And so when the wine was gone, it was a big deal. I guess it would be kind of like running out of dessert. Or in our case at Journey, that one time we ran out of pizza and half people didn't get to eat. So this was a big deal and very embarrassing moment for the bridegroom. So evidently, Jesus' mom was on the wedding committee or something because she mentioned to Jesus that uh, they were out of wine. And now she, she knew that in a crisis, she could kind of lean on, lean on her very resourceful son. It's like she knew that he could do something about it. And so she presented it to him. We're out of wine. Now, maybe she was thinking he could send one of his disciples to the store and you know get some more. Maybe somebody could check around like they did at the feeding of the 5,000 to see who had some. Maybe somebody had a stash at home they could run and get. But whatever, whatever her thinking was, she knew Jesus could help out. Now, this is Jesus, after all. And look at what he says to her. He says, woman... Verse 4, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Now, I, guys, I wouldn't try that at home. Your wife asks you to do something and you say, woman, don't do don't, don't that. I, you might be in trouble. Um, we, we read this and it sounds offensive. Like Jesus was saying, mom, or mom, you know, that kind of a deal. But it's really not. The word that is used here is really more of a formal word. He was really saying to her like, my lady. My, my mom, in a very kind way. It was a respectful uh, response. And his question to her is really a statement. Like, Mom, I've come to save the world, not weddings. Th this is not how I plan to go public, but okay, Mom. Now, to be honest, I've always thought that this first sign was a little weird. I mean, turning water to wine, and most people didn't even know about it, and what did that have to do with anything? I mean, really? Is that that's your first miracle? But I've learned something as I've been preparing this week that helped me understand why Jesus performed this particular miracle. So again, Mary, Mary just turned to those who were serving and said, uh, "Do whatever He tells you to do." And then she leaves. She just leaves him there. It's kind of like, "Oh, okay, do whatever He says to do." That's probably. Good advice for us though whatever jesus says to do just just go ahead and do it he might have something really special in store for you so she's the mom so she can do that and so she walks off now what's so cool about this sign and, and again i didn't re recognize that until this week is that john knew when he documented this particular sign that this was a perfect the perfect way for jesus to step into his role as messiah and savior of the world. The wedding guests didn't even know that a miracle had taken place, which is so true about most miracles. Most of us don't even know that they're, they're happening while they're happening. But people don't, didn't know, but, but this was a sign, and it was the first sign that Jesus gave to show who he was. And John wanted us to know, even 2,000 years later, that this was the perfect introduction to the ministry and the message of Jesus Christ. So here's what happened. John chapter 2, verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind that the Jews used for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now, this was a Jewish wedding. The Jewish law required that they do certain kinds of washing before, that they, before they did certain kinds of activities so that they could stay ceremonially clean. Uh, sometimes they needed to wash their hands up to their elbows for certain things. Sometimes they just needed to wash their hands for a longer amount of time. There were all kinds of rules and traditions that they had to follow about washing their hands. So, so these really are large clay jars, 20 to 30 gallons each. And they're sitting there empty probably because everyone who came to the wedding had to wash their hands before they could stay there and participate. We, we understand that nowadays with this whole virus thing going on, we're washing our hands over and over and over again. But, but these, these clay jars, these stone jars, they, they represent something. 
These jars are icons of the old covenant that Jesus had come to replace. Jesus decided to go public by using something that would soon be replaced to, the point, to point to what would soon be put in place. God's temporary covenant with the, with the nation of Israel, the old covenant established through Moses at Mount Sinai, was, was coming to an end, and he was announcing that. When it was given, it was perfect. It was, it was way ahead of its time. No other nation had a covenant with God like that. But this old covenant was going to be replaced by a new covenant in Jesus. And these jars represented the old covenant. And Jesus decides at this moment to announce and to illustrate something that, that nobody would understand at that time. In fact, I didn't understand it until this week. Something that was so under the radar and yet was so, so very significant. The story goes on. Jesus said to his servants in verse 7, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. One, one theologian, F.F. F. Bruce, writes, uh, he says, the water provided for pure purification as laid down by Jewish law and custom stands for the whole ancient order of Jewish ceremony, which Christ was to replace with something better. So this sign was the perfect introduction to Jesus's ministry. He says, fill up the empty jars with water just like you always do, like you normally do. And then something special is going to happen. And they're going, to be, they're going to do something that they've never done before. The old is passing away. Something new is coming. Someone new has come. Isn't that cool? I bet you didn't know that either. Verse 8, John 2. Then he's told them, he said, Now, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. Though the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. When he called the bridegroom aside, he, he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. This, this master of the ceremony, the banquet, the, the, basically the head waiter of the banquet, is amazed. He's, he's never seen anything like this before. Everybody brings out the good stuff first, he says. And then when everybody's a little drunk, nobody really cares what it tastes like. But you, you saved the best until now. And God had as well. God had saved the best until right then. The old covenant set the stage for the new covenant, the new that was coming. And in the same way that the new wine was better than the old wine, at the wedding, so, so the coming of Jesus and the new covenant was better than the old covenant that God had made with the Jews. So, so when John the Baptist announced to all the people who were coming to get baptized one day, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, those people understand, understood. They were waiting for the Messiah, that final sacrificial lamb. Jesus was that final sacrifice. He was the final lamb. His sacrifice was enough. When he died, he said, it is finished. His sacrifice paid for all of our sins, yours and mine. Now this changing of the water into wine was, was more than just a miracle. Oh yeah, it was a miracle, but it was, it was a sign. It pointed to something and somebody, but, but none would fully understand it. No one would until later on. John wraps up his story like this. He says in verse 11, when G what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Well, of course they did. His disciples believed in him. But, but here's the question. Why did they believe in him? Because he got them all together and he said, you got to believe, brother, you got to believe. you got to have more faith, sister. Is that why they believe? The reason they believed is because there was a reason to believe. Now, unlike John, our faith in Jesus does not come by seeing. We, we like that. Seeing is believing. We hear that. But we, our faith doesn't come that way. We come to faith in Jesus 
by hearing. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. That's how we come to faith. We're not asked to just believe or to just take it by faith. We're invited, and this is what makes Christianity so significant and so different. We are invited to believe what happened based upon the testimony of people who were actually there. People like John, who actually saw and experienced Jesus' miracles. Now, John came away from his experience with Jesus convinced that God so loved the whole world, not just the Jewish nation, the whole world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So, so often people think that's what Jesus said, but if you have a red letter Bible, that's not what Jesus said. That was John's commentary on what, he's, what he experienced after following Jesus. John was just a simple fisherman who, who spent some time with Jesus, but it changed his life forever. And, and, and John felt like it was so significant what happened, was so important that he wanted to write it down for you and for me and for future generations to come. But not so that we would just know what happened and be impressed. It, it's way bigger than that. He wrote these things with a specific purpose in mind. The, these things that John chose to write down, these miracles, these seven signs that, jo, that John writes about, these conversations, these things, John says they are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So we're going to go through all through these seven signs over these next few weeks that John records. My prayer and my hope for each one of us is that we would believe and that we would have life in his name as well. So why, why do we believe? Now, you, you've been invited to believe, not just in belief, I believe in belief, no. We've been invited to believe in Jesus because of what eyewitnesses like John saw and heard. Our belief is based on evidence, not on faithing it or faking it until you make it. It's going to be quite a journey. I hope you'll join us as we go through this series over the next several weeks. Now again, you know at the end of each service, we, we try to take a time to meditate, to, to reflect, to think about what are we going to do with what we just heard? How has that affected you? How, do you believe? And why do you believe? And maybe just take a minute before you break up from whatever you're doing or, and move on to the next thing and just ask the Lord, Lord, what's, what's the next right step for me? What, what do you want me to to do. And I'm going to pray for you right now, and then uh, if you want to turn this off, and then spend just a moment with Jesus and ask him what he wants you to do with what you just heard. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this truth that we have all been uh, exposed to and re-exposed maybe again today. Thank you for using John, a simple fisherman, to document these signs for us, the signs that you gave to us so that we could put our trust in you and know that you really are who you said you are. Our faith doesn't come by seeing, but our faith comes from hearing your message. And Lord, we've heard from you today, and I pray that you would help us to believe in you, to put our trust in you this day. Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you, Jesus, for sharing your life with us, giving your life for us. Help us to live for you, we pray in Jesus' name.